The following program, The Russ Belleville Show, is intended for responsible adults only. We advocate to the repeal of marijuana prohibition for adults. We discuss the science, culture, and controversy about America's marijuana laws. We do not advocate any illegal activity and encourage all listeners to learn their state and federal marijuana laws. Opinions and claims made by guests and advertisers on The Russ Belleville Show are their own and The Russ Belleville Show cannot be held legally responsible for their validity or reliability. Viewer discretion is advised. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you dry it, you roll it, you smoke it. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you dry it, you roll it, you smoke it. Then it goes down smooth. Hey! Spanning the continent to bring you the truth about cannabis and marijuana law reform. I smoke pot and I like it a lot. <laughs> From the promise of legalization. To the agony of prohibition. One major responsibility is to encourage people to use less drugs. The Rough Bellville Show, the voice of the marijuana nation. Yeah, I hear you. You had a question for me. Now, here's your host, Radical Russ Bellville. Oh, yeah, good day. Welcome, Tokers and Tokets. It is Monday, October 15th, 2012, and it's got to be 420 somewhere in the world. Welcome to the show. We've got all sorts of stuff to cover for you today. Let's also welcome hanging out here on uh, microphone number two. We got Brian the Red hanging out. How are you doing, Brian? Hey, I'm doing fine, Russ. Good uh, to see you, man. It's uh, going to be a busy, busy day. All sorts of stuff happening, and we're kind of flying by the seat of our pants today because I'm expecting all sorts of call call ins for some live events that are happening, happening right now in Salem, Oregon at the state capitol, Women for Measure 80, uh, Moms for Marijuana, uh, Yes on 80, Oregon for Law Reform. A lot of people are gathering down in Salem, Oregon for a rally to bring awareness to Measure 80 legalization. So uh, we're hoping at about 15 after we get a call in from uh, one of the folks that's down there to give us a little live update on what's happening. We'll do that for a behind the headlines segment. Before we get behind the headlines, we'll bring you the 420 headline news, all sorts of stuff going on in the news today, including a study that says drugs are no worse than junk food, and I guess depending on what kind of junk food you're talking about, maybe even better. Uh, We've also got the story that I covered earlier today. Uh, If you were listening live at the 10 o'clock hour, there was a press conference from former heads of the National Institute of Drug Abuse, the ONDCP, and the DEA, who are all gathering together to uh, urge President Obama and Attorney General Holder to take a more forceful public stance against the marijuana legalization initiatives that are pending in Washington, Colorado, and Oregon. So we will talk about that. Also, uh, we've got uh, the conviction of Aaron Sandusky in Rancho Cucamonga to talk about. An Arizona medical marijuana patient suing over a federal raid and medical marijuana moving forward in New Jersey. We'll talk about all of that in our hemp headlines right after our first break. Then at 20 after, we've got our daily toker tunes. Today is Roots Monday, so we'll bring you some more great Roots Monday music from the uh, Reefer Jazz archives. And then at half past the hour, again, we're hoping to speak to some of the people down there in Salem, Oregon. Uh, we'll also take apart that press conference, play a little bit of it for you. And an hour two, Toker Talk Radio, we're going to play the entire 45-minute press conference from those uh, DEA, NIDA, and ONDCP heads. I'll give you my comments interspersed in that uh, as it goes on. And uh, folks, you're going to want to bring your waders because there's a lot to wade through in this one, let me tell you. All that and more coming up here on the Russ Belville Show, the voice of the marijuana nation. Please help support in independent marijuana media visit radicalrust.com slash donate today we are here because you support us and thank you for that support we'll be right back after these messages from our 420 friendly sponsors support these advertisers because their ad money goes straight to the rust belleville show You're tuned into the Russ Belleville Show, the voice of the marijuana nation. I don't like it personally, but it's time for a conversation about legalizing marijuana. It's a multi-million dollar industry in Washington State and we get no benefit. What if we regulate it? 
have background checks for retailers, stiff penalties for selling to minors. We could tax it to fund schools and health care, free up police to go after violent crime instead. And we would control the money, not the gangs. Let's talk about a new approach, legalizing and regulating marijuana. 17 states and the District of Columbia have legalized the use of marijuana for medicinal purposes. Over 70% of the American public supports the use of marijuana for medicinal purposes. What does Governor Mitt Romney think of medical marijuana? So medical marijuana is legal in Colorado. One of our viewers, Bill Ferguson, asked, should Real marijuana be legalized health for health medical use? Aren't there, issues, aren't there issues of significance that you'd like to talk about? The medicinal use of marijuana is a significant issue to the millions suffering from cancer, AIDS, and other chronic pain, nausea, spasticity, and seizure disorders. I, I think marijuana uh, should not be legal in this country. I believe it's a gateway drug to other uh, drug violations. The use of illegal drugs in this country is leading to terrible consequences in places like Mexico and actually in our own country. Okay. I, I, I oppose legalization of marijuana. Now it's time for the 420 Headline News. Kerry Gallagher is off today. I'm Russ Belleville with your news. According to a new report coming out of London, drugs no worse than junk food. Taking drugs is just like eating junk food, a controversial report has claimed. The UK Drug Policy Commission says drug, taste, drug taking is simply another risky behavior, moderately selfish, similar to gambling or a diet of burgers and chips, or as we'd say, burgers and fries. It also says it should not be a criminal offense to grow cannabis for personal use. And rather than trying to ban drugs completely, the British government should concentrate on ensuring that addicts take substances responsibly, the report's authors say. People haven't grasped how cannabis affects the brain, says Mary Brett of Cannabis Skunk Sense, which aims to prevent the use of drugs. They just haven't thought it out. Drugs are illegal because they are dangerous, and cannabis is getting stronger every year. According to the commission, the government's efforts to ban drugs have not reduced their availability and, and may have even worsened the situation. So rather than trying to prevent their use entirely, ministers should just focus on limiting the damage. The report states, just like with gambling or eating junk food, Excuse me, just, be, just like gambling or eating junk food, there are some moderately selfish or risky behaviors that free societies accept will occur and seek to limit at least the most dangerous manifestations rather than trying to prevent them entirely. In other news, uh, reporting from the Huffington Post, states are set to mar legalize marijuana. Three states are set to legalize marijuana and former heads of the Office of National Drug Control Policy, the DEA, and the National Institutes of Drug Abuse say it will violate federal law and trigger a constitutional showdown. On Monday, during this teleconference call, they said that it will still violate federal law to legalize marijuana and passage of these measures will trigger a constitutional showdown. The goal of the call was clearly to put more pressure on Attorney General Eric Holder to make a public statement in opposition to these measures. With less than 30 days before Election Day, the Department of Justice has yet to announce its enforcement intentions regarding the ballot measures that, if passed, could end marijuana prohibition in each state. Peter Bensinger, the moderator of the call and former administrator of the DEA during President Gerald Ford, Jimmy Carter, and Ronald Reagan administrations, began the call, saying, quote, Next month in Colorado, Oregon, and Washington states, voters will vote on legalizing marijuana. Federal law, the U.S. Constitution, and Supreme Court decisions say that this cannot be done because federal law preempts state law. He added, quote, and there is a bigger danger that touches every one of us. Legalizing marijuana threatens public health and safety. In states that have legalized medical marijuana, drug driving arrests, accidents, and drug overdose deaths have skyrocketed. Drug treatment admissions are up, and the number of teens using this gateway drug is up dramatically, end quote. Ben Singer was joined by a host of speakers, including Bill Bennett and John Walters, former drug czars, Chief Richard Beery of the International Associations of Chief of Police, Dr. Robert L. DuPont, founding director of the National Institutes of Drug Abuse, and 
who was also representing the American Society of Addiction Medicine and several others. This entire teleconference will be replayed in its entirety during our Hour 2 Toker Talk Radio at 2 p.m. and 5 p.m. Pacific Time today. Please stick around. In more news, Aaron Sandusky has been convicted, this from HuffPost Los Angeles, G3 Holistic Medical Marijuana Shop owner faces 10 years to life in prison, despite the fact that such businesses are legal in the state of California. Rancho Cucamonga resident Aaron Sandusky was convicted in a federal court Friday of two marijuana-related counts. The first is conspiracy to manufacture marijuana plants and to maintain a drug-involved premises. The second count is possession of marijuana plants with intent to distribute which essentially means he was running a pot shop, notes LA Weekly. On each count, the jury found that Sandusky had worked with at least 1,000 marijuana plants. Sandusky, age 41, faces a minimum of 10 years to life in prison. He was taken into custody after the trial, and the sentencing hearing is scheduled for January of 2013. The charges stem from Sandusky's three medical marijuana collectives known as G3 Holistic in the Inland Empire cities of Upland, Colton, and Moreno Valley. The U.S. Attorney's Office had sent Sandusky letters in October 2011 warning him that the stores were violating federal law, and in response, Sandusky closed two of them. Next month, federal agents raided the remaining store in Upland twice. They seized marijuana plants and $11,500 in cash, wiping out Sandusky's entire business. This has been your 420 Headline News for Monday, October 15, 2012. I'm Russ Belleville. When we come back, an in-depth look at Measure 80 in Oregon with the protesters in Salem. Stick around. legalization is on the Oregon ballot this November. Measure 80 will institute regulations that treat marijuana like alcohol. Measure 80 will provide jobs and tax revenue we so desperately need. Measure 80 will protect children by moving the marijuana market to adults-only stores that check for ID. Measure 80 will free up police resources to focus on real crimes, not the one out of seven adult Oregonians like me who consume marijuana responsibly. Vote yes on Measure 80 and donate to Oregonians for law reform today. I have to say that there, there was one question that was voted on that, that ranked fairly high, uh, and that was whether legalizing marijuana would improve uh, the economy and job creation. I don't know what this says about the online audience. <laughs> uh, the answer is no, I don't think that is a good strategy to grow our economy. So. There's nothing funny about nearly one million lives wrecked by a marijuana arrest every year, Mr. President. Politely tell President Obama what you think about legalization by calling the White House at now and uh, still scrambling to get things put together. You may have noticed that the news whoosh was not there as it should have been. Uh, I had to do some major server upgrades over the weekend and uh, installed some new hard drives, moved a bunch of files around, and apparently the file for news whoosh 
was not where I expected it to be. So still scrambling, trying to make that happen. But welcome back. This is the Russ Belvel Show here, and it's uh, 14 after the hour. And right now in Salem, Oregon, we have uh, members of Women for Measure 80 and other groups that have gathered together to uh, bring some awareness to the Measure 80 campaign that's happening here in the state of Oregon to legalize marijuana. And uh, we're hoping to have some of them call in. I know it's real busy down there, and the way these live things go, uh, we sometimes just have to hold on and wait for them. But uh, they would appreciate some of your support. Uh, they are down there until 3 o'clock today at uh, 900 Court Street Northeast in Salem, Oregon. Uh, they have various speakers who will be uh, appearing there on the steps, including Anna Diaz, the founder of Women for Measure 80, Amanda Rain, Women for Measure 80's Outreach Director and Coordinator for Yes on 80. Also, Shelly Fox Loken and Madeline Martinez from Law Enforcement Against Prohibition will be speaking. Trish Morningstar, a mother and patient who suffers from PTSD, will speak on the need for marijuana legalization since she cannot get it for PTSD medically here in the state. Sarah Frank, the founding director of Moms for Marijuana International, will be speaking, as well as Jessica Parks, a mom and war on marijuana victim. So we encourage you to help them out as best you can. If you cannot make it to the rally today in Salem, you can always uh, give them a call or you can uh, email them if you would like to help uh, uh, later. The campaign office in uh, Portland, Oregon is 503 473 8790. That's 503 503- Four seven three eight seven nine zero, or you can email join at vote eighty dot org. Join at vote eight zero dot org if you have more information. And Anna Diaz can be reached at women four m eighty. That's all numbers there. Women number four m eight zero at gmail.com, women for m eighty at gmail.com. And the uh, website is yes on eighty dot org or vote. 80.org. You can also log on to OregonLawReform.com if you'd like to make a financial contribution to help get some media awareness for the need to pass Measure 80 legalization here in the state of Oregon. And uh, of course, Measure 80 is the uh, measure also known as the Oregon Cannabis Tax Act. Of the three states that are proposing marijuana legalization, Oregon's Measure 80 is by far the most expansive of all the measures, where Washington and Colorado have decided on a one-ounce limit as the definition of personal possession. The Oregon Cannabis Tax Act, or Measure 80, sets no defined limit for personal possession or cultivation. That is, people, so long as they are not selling or engaged in any sort of commercial transactions with cannabis, would be allowed to grow and to possess as much of it as they felt was for personal use. This has led to some critics uh, pointing out that this could mean you know, unlimited personal possession, unlimited grows, but I think it's important for people to realize that this will also be controlled by the Oregon Cannabis Commission, and the legislature can always make changes because this is a statutory, uh, statutory measure that we're talking about here. Uh, for guidance, we might look back to the state of Alaska. In the state of Alaska, they have a, a state constitution that guarantees personal privacy to an extent much greater than the United States Constitution. In deciding personal possession cases and personal cultivations of marijuana, the Alaska Supreme Court, in a decision called Raven v. Alaska, decided that a person's personal privacy trumped the state's ability to burst down their doors to see whether or not they were smoking or growing marijuana. But this personal right to grow or smoke marijuana is not an unlimited right. The courts there have found that at different times, one ounce or four ounces could be considered a reasonable personal limit. There's no reason to think that Oregon wouldn't come up with something similar. There is always going to be somebody who's going to want somebody in law enforcement who is going to want a bright line to to, to delineate and distinguish personal use from potential commercial cultivation and use. I feel that the Oregon legislature and the Oregon courts will very quickly after the passage of measure 80 come up with some sensible and reasonable limits uh, under statute or under administrative rule that will help to guide people as to what is reasonable amounts of personal possession. Should that be an ounce? Should that be a quarter pound? Should it be the same as medical where it's a pound and a half? Well, we don't know yet, but we will find out once this passes. But it is no excuse to continue with the prohibition status quo of arresting 200 Oregonians every month 
for the possession of marijuana. And understand those possession arrests have to be over an ounce since marijuana is decriminalized under an ounce in the state of Oregon. 200 people every month being arrested for more than an ounce. So in my opinion, I believe the personal use should be set at four ounces at least so that we can easily distinguish those people that are just storing some from themselves, maybe uh, getting by with a little help from their friends, so to speak, versus those who are storing warehouses with the intent to distribute or to sell. For more information on all of this, please get a hold of yeson80.org or vote80.org. And let's give our support to all the people here in the state of Oregon who are putting their feet out on the streets in front of the Capitol calling for an end to adult marijuana prohibition in Oregon. Oh my gosh, is it that time already? Oh, well. What's yeah, this? It, it was a little rant. Well, gosh, we better do something about this. We'll be right back. Oh, have you ever met that funny reefer man? A reefer man. Have you ever met that funny reefer man? Reefer man. If he said he swam to China, he would sell you South Carolina. Then you know you're talking to that reefer man. Former federal law enforcement officials speak out about Initiative 502. We know firsthand that decades of marijuana arrests have failed to reduce use, and the drug cartels are pocketing all the profits. Initiative 502 brings marijuana under tight regulatory control. 502 generates new revenue for education, health care, and prevention. And if 502 passes, we'll have more resources to go after violent crime. Join us in voting yes, yes on, on 502. 502. Yar! Army pirates here! Har, 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 har. Everyone knows music and marijuana go together, so let's wind up our 20 after break with the Russ Belleville Show's Daily Toker Tunes, the best in pod safe 420 music from around the web. Today is Roots Monday, featuring the blues, country, folk, and jazz music that birthed the modern sounds we enjoy today. You can get downloads and more information about all our Daily Toker Tunes by visiting music.radicalrust.com. Now, Sit back and enjoy your Daily Toker Tunes. All right, folks, welcome back for our Daily Toker Tunes. And, of course, today is Roots Monday where we cover all the country, blues, jazz, and folk music that uh, led to the music that we love today. And, of course, uh, one of my favorite aspects of this is covering the reefer jazz era, the beginnings of American recreational marijuana use uh, in the early 1910s, 1920s, as it was popularized by the jazz musicians such as Louis Armstrong, Mez Mezro, Cab Calloway, and so forth. Uh, you can catch more of this stuff and a little bit of history, too, by joining us tonight at 8 o'clock Pacific time every Monday night. For the new Viper Hour, I bring you a whole hour of this great reefer jazz stuff, these old 78s that you can't hear anywhere else, and a little bit of the history of American marijuana culture. So please check that out tonight, 8 o'clock Pacific and every Monday night. Now, today for our Daily Toker Tunes, I'm going to dig back into the 1930s and 40s into a group you may have heard of called the Ink Spots. They were a vocal group in the 1930s and 1940s that helped to develop the genre that led to rhythm and blues and rock and roll. And of course, the subgenre that we all call doo-wop music. They and the Mills Brothers, which was another black vocal group of the same period, were, one of the were a couple of the first groups to gain acceptance in the white community and the black community, uh, leading to that that music coming across and of course Elvis Presley stealing a lot of those sounds in the 1950s. Now in their early years from 34 through 36 the, the four piece uh, founding members came out of Indianapolis, Indiana and uh, sang those great four piece harmonies. For today's song we're bringing you a song from the Ink Spots called That Cat Is High. Check it out. Boys I'm mellow as a honeydew Yeah That cat is high no bad look in his eyes. Oh man, he's high. Yes, higher than a kite. That cat is high. No bad look in his eyes. Man, I wouldn't lie. The cat's higher than a kite. Now when you see him stumbling up and down the street, you know that cat's been drinking. Got no shoes upon his feet. Man, he's high. I 
said Baba. that cat is high. Baba, Baba. Yes, he's high. Man, he's higher than a guy. That cat is high. Look at that look in his eye. Man, I wouldn't lie. The cat's higher than a guy. Boys, he's high. Just look at them two black eyes. You know I wouldn't lie. He's higher than the sky. When you see him tipping round and round the block. Doggy you Bob! Know that cat is very beat. Beat clean down to his socks. That cat is high. Boys, I wouldn't lie. Oh my, oh my. He's higher than a kind. Take yeah. it, Charlie! John boy, when you see him stumbling up and down the street, you know that cat's been drinking, got no shoes upon his feet. Man, he's high, yes, he's high. My oh my, I want the home cooking mama with the frying pan. I know that cat's high. <laughs> yeah. Dear mom, when I was in college, I used to drink a lot. It was kind of crazy. But now that I'm older, I prefer to use marijuana. It's less harmful to my body, I don't get hungover, and honestly, I feel safer around marijuana users. I hope this makes sense, but if not, let's talk. I love you. Sir, do you think there will or should come a time for us to discuss the possibility of legalization, regulation, and control of all drugs, thereby doing away with the violent criminal market as well as a major source of funding for international terrorism? Thank you so much for your time, Mr. President. Well, I think this is an uh, entirely legitimate topic uh, for debate. Name the time and place, Mr. President. Radical Russ has been prepping for this debate full-time since 2005. The Russ Belleville Show. Activism begins with ACT. The Russ Belleville Show features the stories of hardworking grassroots activists working for an end to prohibition in today's activist agenda. All right, welcome back, everybody. It is 27, almost 28 after the hour here at Roland J Studios in Potland, Oregon. And like I say, we're kind of flying by the seat of our pants for today's show in that uh, I had a major server uh, upgrade here over the weekend, still trying to get all the files put back where they belong, and also was expecting some call-ins here from the people in Salem, Oregon, who are currently rallying for Measure 80. Apparently, uh, we're not going to get that call-in, so having to adjust just a little bit here, trying to find uh, what we'll cover here for today's segment in Activist Agenda. I think what we'll do here is talk just a little bit about this uh, press conference. Now, the press conference will be available. I'm going to be playing the entire press conference just as soon as I can get it cut up here uh, on a break, and we'll play that in hour two. But I will give you some of the highlights here uh, so that I have a chance to rebut some of this nonsense. Now, it was representatives of law enforcement and these drug rehabilitation services, also joined by former heads of the Drug Enforcement Administration, or DEA, the National Institutes on Drug Abuse, or NIDA, and the Office of National Drug Control Policy, ONDCP, otherwise known as the Drug Czar's Office. They had a teleconference today for members of the press to reiterate their call 
for President Obama and Attorney General Eric Holder to more forcefully and publicly oppose the marijuana legalization ballot measures in Washington, Oregon, and Colorado. The press conference was moderated by Peter Bensinger, who's a former DEA head under Presidents Ford, Carter, and Reagan. But he's currently the CEO of Benzinger, DuPont, and Associates, which is a privately owned professional services company that provides a wide range of consulting, training, and employee assistant program services to promote a drug-free workplace. Mm -hmm. So there's some uh, financial interest in there for Peter Benzinger. He's not coming at you here as just a concerned citizen preventing people from using drugs and forcing them into rehab through the criminal justice system is what keeps his company in business. Now, Benzinger explained that legalization of marijuana is expressly forbidden by federal law and the U.S. Constitution and the decisions of the United States Supreme Court, which is uh, an interesting point of view. This is something they've been trying a lot here is, oh, you, you can't legalize marijuana. Why, it's against federal law. Yep. Yes, it is. And so is medical marijuana. Medical marijuana that now exists in 17 states and the District of Columbia, the very seat of government from which these men are saying it's federally illegal. Yes, we know it's federally illegal. And this is the way change happens in this country is when the states realize that a federal policy is doing more harm than good and they rebel against that federal interference. We can look all the way back to things like Dred Scott uh, Supreme Court decision and the people in the North that were fighting against slavery and running the underground railroads and harboring fugitive slaves. They were in violation of federal law. They were in violation of court decisions, but they were right. Just as the people that helped segregate the schools in the 50s were right. Just as the people who were the gay activists fighting against Lawrence v. Texas and the criminalization of sodomy were right. Sometimes the feds are wrong and sometimes the states have to fight them on this. So this scare tactic of why the feds won't let you do this, it's illegal, is bunk. Sure, the feds are going to have a problem with people smoking and cultivating and trafficking and buying and selling marijuana. They already do. They've already got a problem with that. The thing we are talking about here are three states taking this market out of the hands of criminals, out of the hands of violent people, and putting it into a regulated market like we do alcohol and like we do tobacco. Two substances that are far more addictive and far more harmful than cannabis could ever be. So the scare tactic of the, you know, the feds won't let it happen, you also have to understand that there are numerous court decisions and federal and you know constitutional precedent that say states do not have the job of enforcing federal law. So if Washington, Oregon, and Colorado legalize marijuana, the feds can still think it's all as legal as they want it, illegal as they want it to be. But the feds will have to be the ones making the arrests. The Portland City Police, the Multnomah County Sheriff, and the Oregon State Police, and their counterparts in Washington and Colorado will no longer be busting people for those things. So if the feds think they got enough cops to send out to three western states to prevent us all from smoking pot, I guess then I'm afraid of what the federal government thinks. Now this Benzinger, again, the guy who's the CEO of a company that provides employee assistance programs, Benzinger claims that in the states that have legalized medical use of marijuana, accidents, teen use, addiction, and drug rehab admissions have all skyrocketed. That's his words, skyrocketed. In fact, when you look at the research, we find that medical marijuana has not led to increased teen use. In fact, when we look at the medical marijuana states, the, st the study that we got, and this one, uh, I believe, comes from Time or was reported uh, in Time magazine, among other places. Medical marijuana does not increase teen drug use. And uh, the three economists were led by Daniel Rees of the University of Colorado at Denver, analyzing data from the U.S. Centers for Disease Control's Youth Risk Behavior Survey. The team, the team found that while teen marijuana use has risen since 2005, the increase was not correlated in a statistically significant way with whether or not the state that teens resided in had legalized the drug. Rees said in an online statement from the University of Oregon, quote, there is anecdotal evidence that medical marijuana is finding its way into the hands of teenagers, but there's no statistical evidence that legalization increases the probability of use. So, uh, 
th- and this is something that we find across the board. Yeah, sure. Marijuana use may rise. Marijuana use may fall. But if medical marijuana, if the slight legalization of medical use has led to any increased use, we're not seeing it. California does not have a greater rate of, of kids using marijuana, an increase in rate of kids using marijuana, than Utah or Louisiana or any other states. That is to say that the increase or decrease in marijuana use rates does not correlate in any way with whether or not that state has a medical marijuana program. Now, my personal thoughts on this is that kids who get marijuana get marijuana. And as the government has told us so many times, marijuana is fungible. So if you had 10 kids that were smoking pot when there was no such thing as medical marijuana, then all 10 of those kids were getting illegal marijuana. But now if you got 10 kids that are getting marijuana and say three of them are managing to get it from some location or some provider that uh, has some tie to medical marijuana, we still just have 10 kids using marijuana. So what if three of them happen to get it from a newly legalized source? If the, the rate overall is not a problem, what difference does it matter the label we put on that marijuana? Now, to attack another one of Benzinger's uh, points here, he says that addiction to marijuana has gone up in the medical marijuana states. Addiction to medical marijuana, which, of course, uh, the term addiction does not really apply well to marijuana. It's more a case of dependence. In fact, the dsm 4 the statistical manual that the psychiatrists and psychologists use to uh, cover mental health issues, is not even going to have a marijuana dependence in it anymore because scientists cannot come to any sort of conclusion that there really is such a thing. But let's just take NIDA at their word here. According to National Institutes of Drug Abuse, the very people that DuPont of Benzinger, DuPont and Associates, that DuPont used to head up, NIDA, his own stats say that 9%, not 90, 9% of first time initiates, that is people who ever try to smoke pot, will develop some sort of dependence to it. One out of 11 people who smoke pot will end up becoming someone who's dependent upon it. Compare that to NIDA's own figures of 15% for alcohol use. Anybody who ever tries alcohol, 15% of them become an alcoholic. And 32% for tobacco use. That's right. Almost a third of the people who try a cigarette become a smoker, a lifetime smoker. Now, as far as So, so yeah, you want to say that marijuana has got a dependence problem. Sure. Okay. 9%, which by the way, is about the same rate of dependence NIDA claims for people who use caffeine. So marijuana is about as addictive as caffeine, but uh, alcohol and tobacco are legal despite being far more addictive and far more harmful. And, And this thing about the rehab rates have increased. I always love hearing this from a DuPont, from a Benzinger, from someone who's got stock in, you know, who, who makes money off of shuffling people through rehab. I love hearing this stat about how rehab admissions are up and that's why we need to keep marijuana illegal so we can bust more people and send them to rehab because that's really what's happening here, folks. The admissions to rehab for marijuana have skyrocketed because the use of drug courts have skyrocketed. And again, not to say that I'm cherry picking any sort of data here. I'm getting this data from them. I'm getting this from the rehab industry, from NIDA, from the federal government. This is from the National Associations of Drug Court Professionals, NADCP.org. Operational drug courts in the United States. When they were first founded in 1989 and 1990, there was one, one drug court. In 1990, by 1996, they had finally reached 139 drug courts in the United States. 492 drug courts existed 10 years after they were begun. And by 2010, there are now 2,633 drug courts. And every one of those drug courts, when they get someone coming through there who's got a, a charge of marijuana, they are automatically considered to be a marijuana addict, a marijuana dependent. And these drug courts give them the so-called choice of going to jail or choosing rehab. Now, what person who doesn't have a marijuana problem is going to say, oh, you know what? I don't really need rehab. Why don't you just send me to jail? (laughs) Nobody is going to say that. So when you see these increasing rehab numbers, 
Yeah, it's people that are choosing rehab over jail. When we look at the statistics, 60%, three out of five of the people who go to rehab for marijuana alone, no alcohol, no other drugs, for marijuana alone, 60% of them are referred there by the criminal justice system. That's three out of five pot smokers going to rehab because they have to not because they have a problem. And furthermore, we know that many of them don't have a problem because the rates of use of people going into rehab, because when they first go into rehab, you know, they test them and they ask them, you know, have you been using in the past day or week or month or whatever? 37% of the people in rehab for marijuana said they had not used marijuana 30 days prior to going to rehab for marijuana. That's right. They've got an addiction that's so severe. They've got withdrawal that's so terrible. They're able to voluntarily go a month without using marijuana before they end up in the rehab bed. Of course, a rehab bed that a meth user or a heroin user or a cocaine user or an alcoholic can't sit in because it's being taken up by the marijuana smoker whose only problem with marijuana was getting caught with it. We're going to tear this apart just a little more in preparation for playing the whole thing at 2 o'clock and 5 o'clock. Stick around. It's simply business. It's simply business. It's simply business. You know why they won't let us grow. It's simply business. We'll be right back after these messages from our 420 friendly sponsors. Support these advertisers because their ad money goes straight to the Russ Belleville Show. You're tuned into the Russ Belleville Show, the voice of the marijuana nation. It's simply business. It's simply business. It's simply business, you know why they won't let us grow. It's simply business. It's simply business, you know why they won't let us grow. It's simply business. Normal stands for responsible adult cannabis use. If cannabis use is causing problems in your life, consider taking a break or seeking medical assistance. Consider ceasing cannabis use if you have a family history of mental illness. Don't drive or operate heavy machinery while impaired by cannabis use. Cannabis use is not without risks, even though the risks may be far less than those posed by legal drugs. You want answers? I'm as bad as hell, and I'm not going to take this anymore! You want answers? You have offended my family. I think I'm entitled. You want answers? I want the truth! And you have offended Shaolin Temple. You can't handle the truth! Surely you can't be serious. I am serious. And don't call me Shirley. Hoorah! Welcome back, everybody. 42 after the hour. We're still talking about this press conference, this unbelievable press conference. I'm going to play the whole thing here in about 15 minutes. You'll get to hear the full uh, reefer madness, as it were. But uh, pretty amazing. It was represented as a law enforcement and, and uh, drug rehabs and DEA and NIDA and ONDCP. The whole clown car of prohibitionists uh, are <laughs> are represented on this teleconference, which uh, had members of the press involved as well. Uh, Dominic Holden from The Stranger uh, was online, asked a couple of really good questions, as did the reporter from Legalization Nation at the East Bay Oakland Express. I was on the line. I had a question in the queue, but uh, they all ask you to identify yourself. And I said, well, Russ Belville. And they said, well, who are you with? And I said, uh, well, I'm an independent journalist. And I think that sunk me. I think they, they heard blogger when I said that. So uh, did not get myself uh, my question uh, asked or even answered. But Dominic Holden did a great job. We'll get to his question. And again, I'm going to play this whole press conference here in hour two, just as soon as I can get it chopped up. In fact, I better take a look at this right now and see where we're at with it. So uh, give me a moment. I'm going to play a little bit of music while I get that ready, and then we'll come back and uh, dissect just a little bit more of this. Stick around. Okay, well, let's try that. There we go. Oh. 
life's hard. Uh, I need a car and a job and a house and a lawn and a bad broad who cooks and gets back massages. Yeah, I need a lighter in the day to be inspired if I may. I say what up tomorrow if I don't say hi today. You know I'm busy making music if I don't come out to play. Cause when things go wrong, I just need the right song. No trade, I'm gone off Jose. Fuck with all them hoes say. I can't hear them anyway. I got my headphones on and I'm walking around your city like a clown king Kong. Like my shit don't stink, like my shit won't sink. But I think I'll have a drink and another and another. I hope I don't fall before I reach next summer. But nah, I done came too far to yeah. quit. And I swear I know it all, but I don't know shit. They swear they know me, but they don't know this. Yeah, it seems like you need luck to live. Well, when I'm running out of fucks to give, I put my hands in my pockets, music in my ears, hands in my pockets, music in my ears. Yeah, yeah. it seems like you need luck to live. Well, when I'm running out of fucks to give, I put my hands in my pockets, yeah. music in my ears, smoke a weed, hands in my weed. pockets, music shit. in my ears. Shit. I got a lot of heart, I don't got a lot of dollars. Making plans, trying to see my man in Guatemala or Peru. Rolling pot up with some hotties by the pool Doing all the shit that probably seem impossible to you And I never seem to win when I got a lot to lose So I had to take the lead instead of following the rules Oh, I don't realize I notice when I'm doing it But every time I meet a girl, I always seem to ruin it I shouldn't have to say it, she knows it's from the heart And now we at goodbye, and I don't know where to start And so I'm with my friends, nobody know me better And I don't go to bed, cause I'm lonelier than ever I guess she had to go But she had me at hello I heard you felt the same I'm happy that I know And now I got it all I could lose it in a year But nothing seems to matter With some music in my ear It seems like you need luck to live Well, when I'm running out of fucks to give I put my hands in my pockets Music in my ears Hands in my pockets Music in my ears Yeah, it seems like you need luck to live well, when I'm running out of fucks to give I put my hands in my pockets uh, Music in my ears Hands in my pockets Music in my ears Yeah, 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 yeah Uh-huh, uh-huh, yeah, yeah And I can't even sing We still try though <laughs> yeah, But fuck y'all niggas uh, I know you got it. Welcome back. That's music from Ground Up. That's Lady Luck. Sorry for the delay there. Like I said, doing it live today. That press conference was at 10 o'clock uh, Pacific time and then uh, ran till about 11 o'clock Pacific. And then, of course, 11, I got to walk a dog and get some lunch and run back home and convert stuff. And then I was surprised to find that the uh, Dropbox on the Liebermater had gone and deleted about, oh, most of my songs. So. <laughs> scrambling but here we are because uh, we're doing it live and uh, we do it for you here in the cannabis community continuing on with the uh, radical rant which... thanks eddie continuing on with the uh, radical rant we're going to uh, talk about this press conference and then coming up in about 13 minutes we're going to play it for you uh, it's about 45 minute press conference at the end of it we'll take calls and you can make your uh, opinions known what you think of these uh, former federal officials and current rent seeking drug rehabbers uh, about their opinions on marijuana legalization in Colorado Oregon and Washington I'd left off uh, talking about uh, Benzinger this is uh, Peter Benzinger the former head of the DEA under Ford Carter and Reagan, who's currently CEO of Benzinger DuPont Associates, which, uh, you know, does consulting for drug free workplaces. Uh, one of his excuses here as to why we needed to uh, keep marijuana prohibited was that accidents are on the rise, right? Because of marijuana use, uh, terrible, terrible amounts of accidents. Now, uh, I took a look at some of these statistics because, you know, that's the kind of guy I am. And I, I don't have figures for all the medical marijuana states. Uh, just because there's 17 of them now, there's a lot of figures to, you know, to gather. But I do know here in the state of Oregon, one of the first states to legalize the medical use of marijuana and one of the top five states for the total number of patients enrolled in the program that our workplace injury, illness and fatality rates are at their lowest ever recorded levels. And again, don't take my word for it. This is the stats. This is the stuff coming directly from the governments themselves. This comes from the Oregon 
Occupational Safety and Health Administration, a news release that they had in July of 2011 that specified that the rates of uh, fatalities and injuries in the state of Oregon in our workplaces have never been better. It's never been a better time to be working in the state of Oregon. They've never been safer. According to their news release in 2011, 2010 figures represent an all-time low in workplace deaths, that is workplace fatalities. Uh, according to their report here, uh, they say, and let me find the uh, find the information on this just a second. According to this, uh, they say that statistics for the past de decade illustrate a continuing and positive trend. Uh, in 2009, there were 31 fatalities. Uh, in 2008, there were 45 fatalities. In 2007, there were 35. The average in the 90s was 55. The average in the 80s was 81. And this in 2010, how many people died in Oregon workplaces? 81 in the 80s was the average. 55 in the 90s was the average. In 2010, 17. 17 people statewide in the state of Oregon with 50,000 medical marijuana patients. That's right, 17. So, so much for our workplaces becoming less safe. And on-the-job injuries, again, this is a quote from Oregon OSHA, on-the-job injuries have also been declining in recent decades. The statewide rate of reported workplace injuries and illnesses has decreased more than 50% since the late 1980s. So, uh, so much for that talking point about it being so dangerous if we were to legalize marijuana. Benzinger also continued with another claim. Who, he said that the voters in California who rejected Prop 19 to legalize marijuana in 2010 did so because they recognized the threat to public safety and that it flies in the face of federal law. Okay. Now, it couldn't have anything to do with the fact that uh, you drug czars uh, came out in the week before Prop 19 was to be voted on and, uh, you know, toured all about the state and scared the hell out of people with some of these lies. That couldn't have had anything to do with it. Joining us on the, on the uh, teleconference also was former drug czar John Walters. He's now the chief operating officer and executive vice president of the Hudson Institute, which is a think, think tank that also makes money off of marijuana being illegal. Uh, John Walters, of course, once famously said that, quote, finding a first time marijuana non The fact is today people don't go to jail for possession of marijuana. I know you like to pretend it does, and there's a lot of misinformation about that, but um, finding somebody in jail or prison for a first time nonviolent offender for possession of marijuana is like finding a unicorn. You find one, you will make a big story because it doesn't exist. He says that finding a first time nonviolent marijuana offender in prison is like finding a unicorn because they just don't exist. Now, he also wanted to remind the press that marijuana is the most prevalent of drugs that for which people are seeking treatment. We've already debunked that. He reiterated that 2.5 million people tried marijuana for the first time this year, more than those who tried cigarettes, and that more American teenagers now smoke marijuana than tobacco. But Walters did not address why that is the case, because marijuana smoking rates have held fairly steady while tobacco smoking rates have been on a rapid decline despite being three and a half times more addictive than marijuana and legally available to teenagers at age 18. Walters also claimed that countries that have relaxed their marijuana laws, like Britain and the Netherlands, are now working to reverse those policies. He did not comment on the British scientists who vigorously opposed stronger restrictions on marijuana that were enacted by a new conservative government, and he ignored the fact that the Netherlands and Portugal which he notice, noticeably ignored, have rates of hard drug use, adult marijuana use, and teen marijuana use that are much lower than in prohibitionist America. Now, another uh, person who got up to speak in this teleconference was a uh, representative from the International Chiefs of Police Association, Richard Beery. He warned about the public safety risks of legalization. He claimed that Californians rejected Prop 19 because they realized the $1.5 billion they'd take in from taxes would be more than offset by the $4 billion in increased costs from traffic accidents. Except he didn't cite any source for that $4 billion claim in traffic accidents. And as I pointed out earlier, National Highway Traffic Safety Administration shows reductions in fatalities, accidents, and injuries on America's highways, even in California. 
Now, uh, he continued to emphasize that the FDA has never said that marijuana is a safe or effective medicine and that dispensaries and medical marijuana states attract crime and violence. Mm -hmm. This despite reports from sheriffs in both California and Colorado, Los Angeles and Denver, who say this is not the case. This uh, Richard Beery from the Chiefs of Police expressed that legalization would sanction marijuana as legally and socially acceptable. And if anything, we should be working to make it less accessible to kids. He is apparently unaware that for decades, kids have found marijuana easier to buy than alcohol because drug dealers don't check IDs. He also called into question the need to legalize marijuana anyway, since, quote, marijuana has been decriminalized nearly everywhere and nobody's rotting in a jail cell over marijuana, end quote. Uh-huh. Except that marijuana is only decriminalized in 15 states. The, there are 850,000 people arrested every year, and they all spend at least some time in a jail cell awaiting booking. And others of them end up doing anywhere from a few days to a few years in prison. Now, uh, this did allow for some questioning from the members of the press. Uh, East Bay Express was there. There were a few representatives from the Mexican press as well. Uh, one uh, person asked about the worst case scenarios from law enforcement at the federal level if any of these initiatives should pass. Like, what will the DEA do? What will the feds do? Benzinger explained that legalization would not generate tax revenues because the sellers of marijuana won't pay taxes and put themselves in the federal crosshairs. Ignoring, of course... The hundreds of medical marijuana dispensaries that are doing that right now. Uh, one of my favorite reporters, Dominic Holden from The Stranger in Seattle, asked if any of the prohibitionists believe America is safer overall following the repeal of alcohol prohibition. And why would ending marijuana prohibition not also be a net public safety good? Robert DuPont, former director of National Institutes of Drug Abuse and the founder of Benzinger, DuPont and Associates, dodged the question by expressing that repeal of alcohol prohibition did increase use of alcohol and associated alcoholism problems. But Holden did not relent and asked again about the net good of repealing prohibition of alcohol as a national public health policy, despite the harms individual drinkers might have experienced. Benzinger interrupted at that point and cut the conversation short by explaining that we weren't here to get into a discussion about the history of alcohol prohibition. Yes, let's let's not learn from history in any way. Let's just ignore the previous time we tried this. There's nothing we could learn from that. John Walters joined in by explaining that alcohol is legal and we have over 135 million alcohol drinkers. Can you imagine the problems we'd have with over 100 million marijuana smokers? As if there's 74 million people who aren't smoking pot right now who would if it were legal. And let me get to some of these other questions from the press uh, that are available. I got some of this up at uh, the blog at RadicalRust.com if you'd like to read this. But so I want to get this question uh, from the Mexican press here that was just very, very interesting. Oh, uh, other other quotes. Uh, one of the guys who works from the drug-free workplace, uh, I forgot his exact name. He has a quote in the uh, press conference where he says, drug users are one-third less productive. That's right. Drug users are one third less productive, he says to the guy who's running a computer and a soundboard and a stream and producing 20 hours of original content and 10,000 words a week. <laughs> yeah, less productive. I, I bet a whole bunch of employers would like an unproductive guy like me on their payroll. Uh, let's see. We got... Um, there was a question as to whether or not the DEA would concentrate on Washington, Oregon, and Colorado, but the uh, the basic response from the drug warriors was that the DEA would probably concentrate on the sellers and cultivators, but not the individual users. And in the same breath, they want to tell us it's for our own safety. It's for your own safety, but if you manage to get a hold of some, we'll leave you alone. <laughs> okay, gotcha. Uh, let's see. Uh, the question from Mexico uh, was interesting, uh, and one of the responses to this was, it would send a terrible message to Mexico if we were to legalize, because marijuana is not dangerous because it's illegal. It's dangerous because of the health risks. Really, really, because of the health risks. In fact, Walters, when he was pressed on this, was asked, are lives at stake because the Obama administration won't speak up on legalization? And John Walters said, yes, because of drug driving, gateway drugs, and the fact that all of this could lead to stats worse than what we see with alcohol. That's right. We legalize marijuana 
and the roads will be filled with stone drivers. There'll be mayhem and death and criminality, and the world will come to an end. Except that it didn't when we legalized medical in 17 states and decrimmed in 15 states, and the Netherlands tolerated it, and Portugal tolerated it. Nothing bad happened. Hey, let's, let's let you hear it. Coming up next, the entire press conference. For Brian the Red, I'm Radical Russ. Thanks for joining us. Until next time, take care of each other, tokers. This is the Russ Belleville Show. The Russ Belleville Show is blogging and podcasting daily at RadicalRuss.com. You take a scene, you manage, you grow it, you try it, you roll it, you smoke it. You take a scene, you manage, you grow it, you try it, you roll it, you smoke it, and it goes down smooth.